this is Dr. Molly Gebrian, and you are watching the second part in a five-part series on what musicians can learn about practicing from current brain research. If you missed the first part and you want to watch that, the link is in the comments below. So this second part, we're going to talk about random versus blocked practicing. Um, and as I said in the intro video, this is the most controversial part of this presentation, not because the science is at all controversial, but because it goes against how many musicians were taught to practice. So before we get started, I just wanted to define a few terms. So an example of blocked practice, and these are viola orchestra excerpts since I'm a violist, um, an example of blocked practice would be something like Don Juan for 30 minutes, Mendelssohn Scherzo for 30 minutes, Beethoven 5 for 30 minutes. So you do each thing for a block of 30 minutes, focus on that thing, and then move on to the next. An example of random practice would be something like Don Juan for 10 minutes, Beethoven for 10 minutes, Mendelssohn for 10 minutes, Beethoven for 10 minutes, Mendelssohn for 10 minutes, Don Juan for 10 minutes, etc. You get the idea. In the end, you've done everything for 30 minutes total, but it's all mixed up 10 minutes at a time. On the face of it, this way of practicing, constantly switching between things, seems like a terrible idea. Really chaotic, unfocused, unlikely to produce any results, but science says resoundingly otherwise. Um, so what I like to do in this presentation is I like to present a bunch of studies that look at random versus block practicing to hopefully convince you that this is something you should be doing. And then once I've convinced you, I'll give you some ideas on how to actually use this in your own practicing. So the study I always like to start with was a study that was done on baseball players. And I like it because it's extremely clear. So in this study, these baseball players were in college on a baseball scholarship. And the point of the study was to increase their batting average. So how many balls can they hit? They broke the baseball players into two groups. So they had a blocked practice group and a random practice group. The blocked practice group got pitched 15 fastballs, then 15 changeup pitches, then 15 curveballs, and they had to hit as many as they could. The random practice group also got 45 total pitches, but they never knew what was coming at them. So they might get a fastball, and then two curveballs, and then a changeup pitch, and then five fastballs, and then three curveballs. They never knew they had to adjust on the fly. So during the practice, it looked like the baseball players in the blocked practice group were doing better, were hitting more balls. But when they brought the baseball players back a few days later to do, in our terminology, a performance, they found that the baseball players that were in the random practice group had gotten much better. In fact, the blocked practice group had made a 25% improvement in their ability to hit balls, but the random practice group had made a 57% improvement in their ability to hit balls, which is much better. For those of you who like graphs, here's a graph of that study. So um, if you look at acquisition, that is the practice session. And you can see that the blocked practice group, the triangles, are doing much better than the random practice group, the squares. Then if you look where it says transfer test, that's the performance. And you can see that the two groups switch. Now the random practice group is doing better than the blocked practice group. The reason for this result is because if you think about hitting the same kind of pitch over and over again, you know what's coming at you. You just have to do it over and over again. Versus the baseball players that had no idea what was coming at them, they had to adjust on the fly. That's what a baseball game is like, right? You never know what kind of pitch you're gonna get as, as the batter. And so you have to adjust on the fly. They were practicing adjusting on the fly, so they did better when they were placed in a real world situation. For us as musicians, it seems like, okay, hitting baseball is going to play a concerto. Like, is this actually going to work for me as, as a musician? So fortunately, um, we have a study that was done on pianists. So this study used professional pianists, and they came into the lab for the purpose of learning some short pieces that had been composed specifically for the experiment. So nobody could have known them ahead of time. So the pianists came into the lab to learn these pieces. They were hard enough that you couldn't sight read them, but easy enough that you didn't have to practice them for like months and months before you could actually play them. All the pianists learned all the pieces, some of which they learned using blocked practice, some of which they learned using random practice, and the experimenters controlled that. We don't have to get into experimental design. So anyway, they learned all these pieces, some using block practice, some using random practice. And then two days later, they came back into the lab and played a concert for the experimenters. 
And what they found was exactly the same as the baseball players. So while they were practicing these pieces, it looked like they were doing better at the pieces that they were learning using block practice. But when they actually had to go perform them, they performed the pieces they had learned using random practice much more successfully much more successfully as defined by note and rhythm accuracy. So these are scientists, right? They're not gonna measure like phrasing and musicality, um, but note and rhythm accuracy is still important, obviously. Um, so same result as the baseball players. My favorite part of this study is after the concert was over, they asked all of the pianists, so what do you think is better, block practice or random practice? And all of the pianists said, oh, definitely block practice. And I was like, what? No, like they could see for themselves that the pieces they learned using random practice, they performed much better. But actually that result, thinking block practice is better even when it's very clear that it's not, that result is so common that psychologists have given it a name. It's called the illusion of mastery. And I love that because if you're only doing block practice, it gives you the illusion that you have mastered it. So how many times have you gone to your lesson and said, you know, played in your lesson, doesn't sound like you want, you say to your professor, oh my gosh, I promise I could play this perfectly in the practice room yesterday. Or you get off stage after a concert and you're like, oh my gosh, if I could just do that again, like it would be so much better if I had a second chance. Yes, I'm sure you could do it perfectly in the practice room yesterday, probably because you practiced it a bunch, you did a bunch of repetitions like you should, and at the end of your practice, you could play it perfectly. But that's a very different thing for your brain to have to do than to do it perfectly on the first try, which is what you have to do when you go to your lesson or when you perform. It's much more difficult for our brains to do something perfectly on the first try than to work on it and work up to doing it perfectly. So if we only do block practice, we're not giving our brains a chance to practice what they're actually gonna have to do when we get on stage, which is you only get one try, you better do it how you want right now. The next study I wanna talk about is something that was really eye-opening for me. So this is the first study that was ever done on block versus random practicing in 1979. And for this study, the participants had to hit over like bowling pins with their arms. It seems kind of random, but I think they wanted to come up with something that the participants never would have done before. So anyways, um, they had a block versus random practice group, but they also had an interesting twist in this study in that they had a blocked or random performance group. So a random performance is like what we have to do, like do it perfectly on the first try. A block performance is like our what we would love to do, which is go on stage, try it out a few times, work on it till it sounds good, and then say to our audience, okay, I'm ready, now you can listen to me. So that's a block performance, we never get to do that, but that's what they had to do in this study. And what they found was by far the worst combination was block practice, random performance. That's what we do as musicians. If you look at this graph here, the huge outlier is that combination, block practice versus, and then a random performance. All the other combinations down on the bottom, they're basically the same. And I saw that and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm totally shooting myself in the foot by only doing block practice. And yes, what we were talking about in the last video, the 10 times in a row thing, that is absolutely block practice. But if you only do block practice, Again, your brain does not get to practice what it's gonna to have to do when you get on stage. So then this begs the question, should we be doing block practice at all? Like, should we only be doing random practice? So to answer this question, I have another study. This one was done on basketball players. So this study also had a twist to it. So there was a block practice group, a random practice group, but then there was a third group that had an increasingly random schedule of practice. So to understand what this third group had to do, I'm gonna go back to my orchestra excerpts. So this third group, the increasingly random group, started with block practice. So in our example, that would be 30 minutes Don Juan, 30 minutes Mendelssohn, 30 minutes Beethoven V. Then they moved on to something called serial practice. So in our example, that would be 10 minutes Don Juan, 10 minutes Mendelssohn, 10 minutes Beethoven V. 10 minutes Don Juan, 10 minutes Mendelssohn, 10 minutes Beethoven V. You get the idea. So every 10 minutes you're switching things, so your brain has to sort of readjust and, and reframe what it's doing, but it's in a predictable order, so your brain can kind of anticipate. Then finally, they did truly random practice. So in our example, that would be something like 10 minutes down one, 10 minutes Mendelssohn, or sorry, 10 minutes down one, 10 minutes Beethoven, 10 minutes Mendelssohn, 10 minutes Beethoven, 10 minutes Mendelssohn, whatever, you get the idea. All mixed up 10 minutes at a time in, a, in an unpredictable order. And what they found was that this increasingly random schedule was the best of all. Here's a graph of that. 
So I know the two dark bars look almost identical, but all we care about is the light gray bar. That's that group that did the increasingly random schedule of practice. So this graph is showing errors. So the smaller the bar, the better. The immediate retention, that's a performance right after they practiced. The 48 hour retention is a performance two days after they practiced. And you can see that this increasingly random group is doing the best of all. The experimenters in this study said they think this is the case, that this increasingly random schedule of practice is the best, because first you have to solidify the skill doing block practice. Then you have to kind of up the level of difficulty by doing serial practice. And then you have to test, can you do it perfectly on the first try, no matter what, by doing truly random practice. And I'll say for myself that that's definitely true. If I can't do something 10 times in a row the way I want, there's absolutely no way I can just do it on the first try, no matter what, no matter when, exactly how I want. Um, so, and this, you know, this is true for myself and my own playing. This is true for my students as well. So start with block practice. As you get closer to a performance, transition to more random practice. Um, so before I give you some ideas for how to use this in your own practicing, I want to share one more study because again, this one was really eye-opening for me. So in this study, they put people into a brain scanner to see what their brains were doing when they were doing random versus block practice. And they were especially interested in three different parts of the brain, this ABC on this graph here. So these areas of the brain are involved in higher order thinking. So like planning ahead, um, action selection, that, that sort of thing. And what they found was that when people were doing blocked practice, their brains were activated sort of not that much. You can see on the left-hand side of these, these graphs, the left-hand graph is looking at the practice session. Um, in this study, massed practice means the same thing as blocked practice. Interleaved practice means the same thing as um, random practice. So if you look at the bars for the blocked or the massed practice and compare them to the bars for the interleaved practice, you see the bars for the interleaved practice are much bigger. What that means is when you're doing random practice or interleaved practice, your brain is working much harder than when you do blocked practice. But then if you look at the right-hand side of the graph, you, this is looking at what the brain is doing when you're performing things that you learned using blocked practice or random practice. And you can see that the bars here are bigger for the blocked practice than the random practice. So for the massed practice than the interleaved practice. What this means is that when you perform something that you've learned using random practice, your brain hardly has to do anything at all in the performance. You can see the bars are like almost non-existent. Versus when you perform something you've learned only using block practice, your brain has to do more. That's why those bars are a little bit bigger. So what this means is in the practice room, you do interleave practice, your brain works really, really hard. So you get on stage and your brain hardly has to do anything at all. It's much easier for your brain. I don't know about you when you perform, but when I'm on stage, my brain feels kind of like discombobbled. I can't really think normally the way I do in day-to-day -day life. And so when I get on stage, I want to make things as easy as possible for my brain. And so if I'm only doing block practice, I'm making it harder for my brain than it would have been had I done interleaved practice or random practice. So I saw this and I was like, okay, I really, really need to do some, some random practice. So now let me give you some ideas about how to use this. So my first practice method for you is actually an example of serial practice. So in this method, I use it sort of two ways. So I'll, I'll describe one of them first. So first, the first way is I will pick four to seven spots in my music that are places that I really want to nail in the performance, but I'm worried I might not because they're hard in some way. These are places that I've solidified using block practice. So, you know, 10 times in a row, click it up with a metronome, rhythms and bowings, like the whole shebang of normal, normal practicing. I will take those little baby sticky notes and put one in my music, one at each spot. Then I'll play my first spot. If I'm happy with it, I'll give myself a tick mark on the sticky note. Then I'll go on to my second spot. If I'm happy with it, I'll give myself a tick mark on the sticky note and so on until I've played through all five spots. Then I go back to the first spot. I play that spot again. If I'm happy with it, I get a tick mark on the sticky note. If I'm not happy with it, I have to erase any tick marks I've accumulated on that sticky note. 
the goal is to get five tick marks on each sticky note. So if on any given passage you mess up, you have to erase all the sticky all the tick marks just on that sticky note. So that's one way I use the serial practice thing. The other thing I do is I will keep basically a running list of my of my spots. So I'll, you know, I'll start with my first hard spot, say five after H or whatever, and I'll write it down on my list, play it, and if it's good, I give myself a tick mark. Then I'll go to my next spot, three after L, whatever, play it, if it's good, tick mark. And then I'll just go through all my spots, writing them down. Once I get to the end of the list, I go back to the top, play that one again, tick mark if it's good, erase all the tick marks if it's not, and just cycle through the list in that way. What I find is that certain passages um, get five tick marks pretty quick. Like I go through the list five times and I've gotten them right every time. And so then they sort of fall out of the list. I don't do, then keep going to six times. But there are certain passages that either every single time I mess up something else or I can get like three tick marks or four tick marks and then I keep messing up and have to keep erasing it. And so those ones have to stay in the rotation. Usually I find that when I mess up, it's something different every time, which tells me that I haven't figured out how to focus really yet to really nail it all the way through the passage. However, if I'm missing the same thing every time, like I'm always missing this shift in this passage or I'm always bungling this rhythm, what that tells me is I haven't actually solidified that thing yet and I have to go back and do some blocked practice. So I have to go do, you know, 10 times in a row or click it up with the metronome again or, you know, whatever it is. Um, if though, when I do the block practice, I find that it's fine, and you know, I can do 10 times in a row, like absolutely no problem and it feels easy, then that does tell me, okay, I just have to do more random practice because my brain isn't moving fast enough to be able to do it perfectly how I want on the first try. Another thing I do is I will use an app on my phone called an interval timer. And this is an app that allows you to set a timer to go off every X number of minutes, seconds, hours, whatever. So mine is set to go off every five minutes, but you can set it you know, however you want. And the way I use this is before I start practicing, I will pick out something in one of my pieces that I really want to nail in the performance, but I'm worried might not go well. So the opening of my concerto, say, or you know, for viola players, often in chamber music, our part is da, 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 and then we have this huge solo out of nowhere. So maybe you know the big solo because you just have to you know switch gears and play it perfectly. So whatever it is, I'll pick it out before I start playing. Then I'll start practicing and I'll start my interval timer. I'm practicing something totally different, usually like a completely different piece than the spot I've picked out. So I'm practicing whatever it is I'm practicing. Once my interval timer goes off, I stop whatever I'm doing. I go play the spot I've picked out as if it's a performance, no stopping, no matter what. Often I record it too. And then I go back to whatever I was practicing. And so what this does is it simulates a performance where you just have to get up and do it. And same thing with the serial practice. I find with this that often the first couple times the interval timer goes off, it doesn't sound that good. And it's kind of disappointing because this is something that I've practiced a lot up to this point. But that's a pretty good indication of how it's gonna go if I were to get on stage right now. And I'd much rather know in the privacy of my own practice room that it's not ready to go yet than in front of a whole bunch of people. Um, Often I get the question when I do this presentation in person, okay, so the interval timer goes off, you play your thing and you mess up this thing, like aren't you reinforcing the wrong pathway? If you saw my first video, you know what I'm talking about. That's a great question. Um, I find for me that it's a different thing every time, that's a focus issue, um, that my brain is a little bit behind my fingers. But like the serial practice, again, if I'm missing the same exact thing every time, that means I haven't actually solidified it yet. There are sort of an infinite number of ways to use this idea of random practice. The takeaway from this part of the presentation is that to perform well, you have to practice what your brain is gonna have to do when it gets on stage. And practicing to perform is a really different thing for your brain than practicing to do something. I did not understand that distinction for a very long time. So just because you can do something does not mean you can perform that same thing. And often we spend a lot of time practicing in order to do something. Can I play this piece? Can I nail this shift? Can I play this fast enough? Can I play ricochet cleanly or whatever? 
Just because you can do that does not necessarily mean you can perform that successfully. And that's where random practice comes in. It's practicing for performing. So one more idea with this in mind that random practicing is giving your brain a, a chance to practice what it's gonna have to do in a performance. So when I'm getting close to say an audition or a recital or something, I will at the end of my day when it's late at night and I'm really tired and my brain doesn't work very well, I will make myself do a mock audition or a run through of my whole program and I'll record it. And I feel like, you know, I was saying before, my brain is kind of discombobbled when I perform. My brain is also discombobbled when I'm tired and at night. And so I feel like if I can do a good run of my recital late at night after a long teaching day, then I'll be fine when I get on stage. For my students, most of whom function very well at night actually and are not morning people, I suggest that they set an alarm for like five or six in the morning, like super early in the morning, get up, only do the warm up you think you're gonna have time for the day of the event, and then play down your recital or do a mock audition. This will show you how can you do it when you're not warmed up, you're tired, your brain doesn't work right. If you're afraid you might not get time to warm up, sometimes in auditions you have no idea what the warm up situation is gonna be and that can be really stressful. If you're afraid you won't have time to warm up, set the alarm for 5 a.m., get up and play it cold, don't even warm up and see how you do. Um, so that can be a really effective practice method as well. One more idea, and this works especially well for those of you taking orchestra auditions with your excerpts. Um, take little slips of paper, write down the name of the excerpt on each slip, put it into a little bowl or something, and pick them out at random and have to play them at random because you don't know the order you're gonna to have to do them in an audition. I have also paired that with the interval timer. So interval timer goes off, I pick something out of my, my bowl of excerpts, I play that excerpt down, and then I go back to whatever I was practicing. Interval timer goes off again, I play, pick out another excerpt, have to perform that excerpt. So that works really, really well for, pre for preparing excerpts for auditions. So hopefully I've convinced you that random practicing is worth doing. Hopefully these ideas will get you started on that. Like I said, there's an infinite number of ways to do this. I'm sure you guys can come up with many, many more that I haven't even thought of before. I will say that when you start doing random practice and you've never done it before, it is very frustrating. Um, that's the illusion of mastery thing, right? Block practice lulls us into this feeling of, oh yeah, I play really well, I can do this. And then you do random practice and you're like, oh my gosh, I sound terrible. So when I started doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, no, 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 I don't like this, this feels terrible. But I knew the science, I believed in the science, and I'll say they've done studies on random versus block practicing for like every sport you can imagine, musicians, little kids, elderly people, like throwing bean bags, studying vocab, learning history, like you name it, they've done it. They all come out the same. Random practice is better if you wanna perform well. So I knew the science, I believed in the science, and I was like, okay, fine, 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 I'll do this. This doesn't feel very good, but whatever. I remember the first performance I gave after having done random practice, and I performed so much better at that concert than I ever had before, and I was so much less worried. And so after that, I was totally convinced, like, yes, I have to do this every time. Now, I wouldn't dream of getting on stage having not done a lot of random practice first. For me, it feels like getting on stage having not practiced. So give it a try. Yes, it's frustrating at first, but it's totally, totally worth it. All right, thanks for watching. That's the end of this video. So the next video, part three, is um, about how to use your metronome. So unless you've seen my talk before, uh, I guarantee you don't know. So I hope you'll go watch that one. Thanks.